you will never, ever have to lower your standards for Africans. I'm bringing the best Africans there are. So, of course, they've made it into Kings. And actually, within the, uh, the program is in its 13th year now, half the generation. It's a project of a generation. It's, we're midway to the 25 years we promised the testing for. Within three years of the master's uh, element component of the program starting, we had seven fellows that year. Three, three fellows had a distinction. So the excellence of it was already proven. But that's not why they're there. They are there because they have an idea of the change they want to make. And that's what they come into the room with. That's what they're grilled around. They're there because they're committing to a set of core values. And so the point I'm making is we have the best minds, the brightest minds. But to have change-making minds, it requires an additional set of ingredients to build the cohort who will work together for a lifetime to make the change. Many of our heads of state went to Oxford, Sandhurst, Cambridge, best institutions in their countries or best institutions in the world. It doesn't make them the kind of change makers that we want to see. Likewise, our academics, that those who do not research with integrity and take the best opportunities at the expense of so much in their communities. That's a sad reality. They're not reflexive enough, and we ought to be reflexive enough to do things for change, but it requires some kind of consciousness. And so when I was listening to the science of diplomacy, that's the kind of thing I thought I heard. So if we have a set of core values, if we are bringing people into this community with a set of core values, and we're keeping the company of change-making people, those values have to be respected. They, we have to abide by them alongside the knowledge production with integrity. Of course, the idea, therefore, uh, is we're coming into the room for the career, but not just for the career. We're coming in to transform the self in order to transform the community, the society at large, and to do it together. Otherwise, it's the personal, individual successes are the things we're going to realize for the rest of our careers. So that in itself is a tall order, unless we really think about it. At the African level, at the level of the African Leadership Center, I'm insistent that there's six values that we cannot do without. African-led ideas of change. I've seen, uh, seen us at the United Nations where we sit in closed-door meetings where more than half of the issues on the agenda are about Africa, but yet we pilot the very ideas, the very concepts that are northern-driven for different purposes. Sometimes they're correct for our context, but we don't challenge established ideas to even ask whether they're right for Africa. We borrow them, donors come, and we do the same things over and over again. In my field, conflict relapse, where you've gone somewhere, you have spent $1 billion a year for peace building or peacekeeping, whatever we call it conceptually, and then five years, we go back to the same place. Ten years later, we go back to the same place. What is it that they say it's madness that will make someone do the same things over and over again and get the same result? So, so we need to be bolder, the African-led ideas of change, independent thinking. Those are values that when you marry them and we have the brightest minds in the room, you begin to think about how transformation might come. But it's not enough for the kind of governance context we have where the outcomes or the outputs of our research will be applied. So to my mind, to have integrity research with integrity and also to have personal integrity, they're not disconnected from each other. It's the third value that we work with at the African Leadership Center. But number four, respect for diversity in all of its forms. And I've, I'm seeing that at King's in a different way, which I'll talk about now uh, shortly. But number five, I love it, respect for youth agency. Respect for youth agency, it has to be, it's tied to that issue of diversity, respecting diversity in all its forms. 
Number six, which is also top of the list all the time anyway, is the pursuit of excellence, which is not just academic excellence, but excellence in the way in which we thread through our ideas to make change in society. And therefore, it's a continuous, lifelong thing. It's not just about the certificate we have put uh, in the bag, because as short term, it's transient. But if we were to really look at African ideas, not just for the sake of Africa, but think about Africa in the global context, because our ideas are not just about Africa. Ideas are also good to change the world. So when we talk about African solutions to African problems, and some policymakers have turned it on the head to try as a way to, you know, opt out of Africa, to say, well, let Africans solve their problems. Africans have some of the finest ideas to change the world, not just Africa. In my role as Vice President International, I, I spent two years grappling with the idea that we think about internationalization as, as the idea that we're bringing international students into King's. And actually, when you look at how the Times Higher Education ranks, they keep looking at how many international students are in a university. Think of an African university. How on earth are we ever going to be at the top of the ranks? Then they think about mobility. How many people go abroad? How many students go abroad? Who goes abroad to research? And we also fall into that camp too. We will never be at the top of those ranks. Then they think about citations. Who's writing with whom? Who's researching with whom? What that does for us as Africans, because we don't even have our own rankings in that sense, we use all of those rankings, and yet our socioeconomic and political conditions are different. Then everyone is running to court, to cite someone in the US, someone in the UK, when actually some of the best scholars are around us. We don't want to cite them because, oh, they might not be accepted. Where's the independent thinking? So we take the rankings of the global north. Our universities in the UK do the same. So you actually see some universities that are very high on top of the international rankings, but at home, they're not ranked as high. And the reason is the values we should take to the bank. We don't take them to the bank, and they're global in every way. One is cultural competency, the ability to see the world through the lens of the other. That other in their diversity, it's gendered, racialized, it's ethnicized all over the place, not just in Africa, outside of Africa. Age-based, creed-based, and therefore, we have already brought our biases, our prejudices into the research space, into the decision-making space. And I love that there are as many, or oh, nearly as many uh, men, uh, as, nearly as many women as there are men in this room. That's awesome. I don't know through what process that happened, but it's awesome. But half the time when I see leadership spaces, there are so few women. There are so few young people. At the UN myself, I saw it firsthand. It was not the place where a young person would thrive. I hope it has changed. It is trying to change. So we are the minds that will transform the thought process and bring the intellectual power to bear by thinking independently and changing the concepts and making them relevant to the times and to our own environment and actually then projecting them globally. And it isn't because we haven't done that before. We don't do it nearly enough. But I have to say to you, in my own experience, five out of seven times when we have done it, it's then been appropriated and taken to the global north and resold to us in a different con con concept. Whether it happens in this kind of scientific community, I don't know. But I think it does. That's because we don't stand firmly and work together and collectively. For as long as we work as individual researchers, individual academics and scholars, we will always lose out. Finally, what are the implications, therefore, if we're going to cohort build and start on the basis of uh, the agenda, the change we want to make, and the values that we, we abide by? It requires methodological shift. Of course, 
those values of cultural competency, by the way, and the second one is global problem solving, global, at home and abroad, where problem solving to be relevant to society, but it requires methodological shift. And some of my colleagues in physics and mathematics would say, you cannot internationalize like that. These are universal uh, subjects. English legal system will say so. It's only that, that's why it's called the English legal system. But I learned chemistry. By the way, I loved chemistry and still love it today. I know my periodic table as a social scientist because I learned it through a local rap song. Hi, hey, Linda, beg BC come near Oladele's farm. Never nag Maggie, Alakara singing pass. So Cleopatra around Candy's car, and I can arrange it. So we can innovate. We can innovate through our social context. Methodologically, we need to shift. We need to, therefore, to my mind, at the start of conceptualizing at the inception of any research, all those who are affected by it, who will make decisions about the change relating to that research, should be around the table and should accompany that research all through. Not because they're researchers, but because they are end users. I'm testing it. I cannot tell you that I know it all in it. It's something I'm practicing at the moment, and I'm going to learn from it. Again, that interdisciplinarity means that we have to accommodate and integrate, synthesize the methodologies of other disciplines and this to problem solve. So in policy terms, these methods, so we call it, we're not talking about decolonizing methodologies and so on. We don't have to become so nerdish and so, uh, what will I call it, so dogmatic about what we call decoloniality. But it's about power. And we need to address those power dynamics, not in racialized forms, but across all of the diversities. That's how I understand it. But decolonize we must. We don't have to call it that. So therefore, institutionalizing this through how we design our programs and our research teams uh, in, the same, in the way that we bring interdisciplinary teams into the room, but also continuous working, not a one-off for the research. It's difficult to build a community if we're not working together. And actually, I can imagine, when I think of the, pro the health problems that have plagued my own family, from heart condition to diabetes to stroke, I would readily, at a, you know, at a whisker of birth, join any working group that calls itself the Stroke Society or the Heart Society and join the scientists to see how to alter attitudes in it. But we have to think about how we bring all these affected communities and decision makers into the room. So project funding, again, has to allow that to happen. If we fund projects only because we want the individual ideas, individual researchers, and we do not bring resources to help build interdisciplinary teams to work with those um, uh, uh, principal investigators, then funding institutions are, in, are making it difficult for us to organize ourselves and our research around the problems of our society. And it takes time, but we need to say it to them as well. And so programming, funding, research methodology, all those things need to change, and I hope that that's the kind of conversation that we can have continuously. So therefore, that we build communities of practice by bringing all of the change-making minds that are already brilliant minds, in any case, into the same space for problem-solving purposes. Of course, it means that mentoring has to be a mentoring to my mind. I loved that session. I'm always constantly being mentored by, you know, now I've just brought big data technology into my, uh, into my research. The same research I have had, I have a 10-year research agenda, is one of the things I stopped doing. I stopped doing two or three-year projects to suit a donor. If I think I, I need to study something longitudinally, that is what I'll do, and I'll try to build 
people who are interested around it. I know it's, it's a struggle. There's no question about it. And it's not just here, also abroad, for people who have you know, quirky ideas. You will not get the funding for that research easily because you want to study originally and with integrity. It's not sexy enough, is what you hear. All right? But it's doable if we're moving together in the same direction. With big data technology, the same peace building that I have studied all these years, I'm now able to mine one billion tweets, which I've mined in the last year, to look at the local ideas of peace in Africa. I'm so excited. It will take me four or five years to get to what it really means. I will take it back to challenge the UN and others to say, no, 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 no. What you say here is not, that's not what's happening in these countries. But if I find that it's exactly what is happening, yes, then I, I present it. I say, yes, uh, we know for sure now that's what's happening. So having alumni, having groups around something, building a community around it, I think would help us really make the change that we need. I love that you invited me, but I wanted to offer those thoughts because I think we are onto something here. I hope I can add uh, other disciplines next time. Send people from, you know, uh, some of our people in different African settings, African universities, so that actually what we're truly doing is keeping company, keeping the company of change-making minds. Thank you for letting me keep your company this afternoon. Thanks. <laughs>